insurance fraud in the UK has hit epidemic levels. It's costing us over £2 billion every year. That's almost £6 million every day. <gasps> Deliberate crashes, bogus personal injuries, even phantom pets. The fraudsters are risking more and more to make a quick killing. And every year, it's adding over £50 to your insurance bill. But insurers are fighting back, exposing 15 fake claims every hour. Armed with covert surveillance systems, That's the subject out the vehicle. Sophisticated data analysis techniques, and a highly skilled, dedicated police unit. They're catching the criminals red-handed. Just don't lie to us. All those con men, scammers and cheats on the fiddle are now caught in the act and claimed and shamed. Today, a staggering personal injury scam that was fueled by lies and greed. Her claim had risen to approximately £740,000. An IFED raid develops into a drug bust. It's something I've not seen before in nine years of policing. And the extraordinary lengths that a mother of three went to in order to cash in. She forged the signature of the doctor and also made a stamp from the surgery to authenticate the policy. It's a simple fact of life that accidents do happen. But thanks to insurance policies, in many cases, we are entitled to compensation for these unforeseen mishaps. Local councils see more than their fair share of personal injury claims. But Haringey Council know better than most that when it comes to compensation, some people are never satisfied. In 2008, they received a complaint from local resident Barbara Farai. Mrs. Farai claimed that she fell over while she was walking with her granddaughter. She claimed that she tripped and she fell and she hurt her knee. And she said she tripped and fallen on a broken paving stone. With the level of wear and tear that road and pavements are subjected to, incidents like this are inevitable. So Haringey Council began their usual procedure for such a claim and launched an inquiry. Homes of Haringey didn't dispute the fact that she had fallen, that she had suffered injuries, and the council, when it investigated that claim, found that it had been negligent in maintaining that section of pavement. So we have a genuine claim for a fall that actually happened, and the council had admitted negligence. Sounds like a textbook case for compensation. What could possibly go wrong? Her initial claim was for um, damage to her knee. The, uh, the council made an offer, uh, which was approximately £7,500, on the basis that Homes for Haringey's assessment of the injuries were that it would have resolved itself within a three to six month um, time scale. £7,500 for an injured knee seems fair enough. But Barbara Farai didn't agree and decided to take matters into her own hands. She submitted her own medical um, expert opinion to say that um, she was severely um, incapacitated by the fall and the uh, injuries were likely to be ongoing and severe. We sent Mrs Farai to our own medical experts who agreed that her injuries were substantial and likely to be um, continuing beyond the three, initial three to six months um, original prognosis. In light of the revised assessment of her injuries, Barbara Farai submitted a new claim for compensation. Although it's fair to say that the amount she was asking for isn't quite what the council were expecting. Mrs Farai claimed that her, her quality of life had, had altered so substantially that her claim had um, risen to approximately £740,000. For those of you who aren't mathematically minded, that's almost 100 times the figure that Barbara Farai was originally offered. But how did she get to such an inflated amount? She claimed her husband had to give up his work um, to care for her 24 hours a day. She claimed for additional care support um, beyond her, her family. Um, it was for uh, out-of-pocket uh, expenses, for taxis, 
um, for um, additional um, expenses as a result of not being able to live her life um, normally as she claimed to have done before. The level of care and assistance that Barbara Farai was claiming for was so extensive that Haringey Council began to have serious doubts about the legitimacy of her claim, so they decided to investigate further. We made a decision to put Mrs Farai under surveillance to see if what she was claiming was actually true in her day-to-day -day life. It was felt that Mrs Farai thought that she was being followed and resorted to using um, crutches and getting support from her family members. However, when she felt like that she wasn't being followed, um, the crutches were dispensed with and she was able to walk normally, including carrying heavy bags of shopping up and down the hill, um, entering the house without difficulty. So the surveillance activity in this case we felt was, not only was it justified, it supported uh, the Homes for Haringey's case against Mrs Farai. With the video evidence clearly showing that Barbara Farai's claims were untrue, her case for compensation was falling down. And as Haringey Council's investigations continued, they discovered the severity of her injuries weren't the only thing that Mrs Farai had been less than truthful about. Mrs Farai's original statements made no mention of the fact that she had um, an existing condition of, of arthritis which affected her knee. Both uh, her own medical expert and Homes for Haringey's insurer's medical expert um, agreed that they had been both been misled by Mrs Farai uh, and uh, revised their statements accordingly. Barbara Farai's case was on dodgy ground, but she still had one last chance to set the record straight. We, we presented the, uh, the video surveillance to, to Mrs Farai and her solicitor and um, invited her to um, revise her assessment of the £740,000 claim. Mrs Farai uh, declined that and so the case went to court. So, from an original offer of £7,500 for a legitimate claim, Barbara Farai's greed and fraudulent actions landed her in front of the judge in the High Court. The judge made an assessment that her injuries were unlikely to continue beyond uh, three months and, in his opinion, uh, the claim should have amounted to no more than £1,500 as opposed to the £740,000 that she um, eventually claimed. In fact, the judge was um, of the opinion that she wasn't entitled to claim anything. But unfortunately for Mrs Farai, that was just the beginning. After the judge had said that she, Mrs Farai had lied to the court and to him, um, Mrs Farai and her husband were found guilty of contempt of court Mrs Farai received a three-month custodial prison sentence. The judge awarded uh, costs uh, to be paid by Mrs Farai uh, to Homes for Haringey of £100,000. It's hard to believe, but what had begun as a genuine case for compensation had spiralled into a landmark legal case that sent a clear warning to anyone tempted to exaggerate a personal injury claim. We're not an easy target. We will investigate any and all cases that we think are made fraudulently and we will always seek the heaviest penalty. Still to come, surprising discoveries. Just stumbled across something that's, that's quite important. It will have a big impact on the local community. And a summer holiday scam. What set out to be a family holiday in Lanzarote, it turned into a nightmare for her. Owning a pet can be an expensive business. The good news is that a pet insurance premium can cover unforeseen vet bills and even pay out in the event that your furry friend is lost or passes away. But inevitably, some people have seen these policies as a means of pocketing a few quid. And in 2005, the insurance company Agria dealt with a policyholder who, it would turn out, lost pets with staggering regularity. 
So the policyholder was a, a, a traveller who lived in Scotland, and part of the complication of the case was that he had multiple addresses. So very difficult to pin him down, very difficult to tie one address to another. The first claims received from this policyholder were for two St Bernard puppies. Now they were worth £850 each, um, and they'd just been lost. Losing a set of keys or a £10 note is one thing, but to misplace a pair of St Bernard puppies, that really takes some doing. With no vet's records and a dubious set of circumstances, Agria had their doubts too. It was very uh, uh, suspect. Um, we just couldn't gather the, the evidence to prove that the puppies hadn't existed or the policyholder didn't own them. So the ultimate resolution to that was that we paid, we paid the case. So that's one claim and one payout. Of course, it may have just been bad luck. However, less than a year later, another claim form landed on Agria's doorstep from the same policyholder. This time, it was £350 for a poodle puppy that had died. But once again, the details were sketchy at best. It had an illness, but it hadn't seen a vet, so we couldn't establish that the animal had actually existed or that the policyholder had owned the animal. And then when the animal died, there wasn't a veterinary certificate because the vet hadn't certified it dead. With the claim raising so many unanswered questions, Agria rejected it and didn't pay the policyholder a penny. It is possible that the, uh, the policyholder could have been very unlucky. I think with the, the lack of pushback from them, perhaps you know, we'd, we'd, we'd called or made the right call in that instance. But this wasn't the last that Agria heard from the claimant, because just over 18 months later, they received another claim form. This time, it was an encore of the Disappearing Dog Act except that this one was a pedigree bulldog worth over £2,000. The policyholder had set the puppy loose in the back garden, come back ten minutes later and the puppy was missing. The puppy was actually a year old, but that wasn't the only thing about the claim that didn't quite add up. Quite bizarrely, for a year old animal, it had never seen a vet, so it had no veterinary records, and when the breeder uh, had uh, submitted the, the purchase receipt, surprisingly, it, it had got lost in the post. Suspicious that the missing bulldog was, in fact, just a load of bull, Agria decided to investigate. We'd sent the lot of justice out. Um, they couldn't verify that the, the, the puppy had, had or hadn't been lost. So on a balance of probabilities, we, we settled the claim. So that's three claims and two payouts to the same policyholder. But just over a year later, Agria's pass crossed with the claimant once again when they spotted something on the paperwork which set alarm bells ringing. When the claim form came in, it was from a completely different address and from a completely different policy holder. But on the front of the claim form was one of the addresses that the previous policy holder had been using, and that address uh, was, was given as the address of the breeder of the puppies. So instantly, there, with the past history, there were uh, suspicions raised. Unsurprisingly, Agria wasted no time in investigating the claim. But when they visited the owner, they made a rather unusual discovery. There was no indication uh, that dogs had, had ever lived there in terms of bowls, in terms of leads, in terms of baskets, in terms of dog food. So we were highly suspicious. After the visit, the owner ceased all communication with Agria, and with zero evidence that the dogs ever even existed, the case was closed. So that's four claims and two payouts. But you've guessed it, that wasn't the last time Agria dealt with what had to be the world's unluckiest dog owner. In this instance, uh, it was a pug puppy, and the pug puppy had got parvirus. So this was a claim for veterinary fees. Uh, the puppy did subsequently die, but initially on the original claim, parvirus is something that the insurance policies expect owners to vaccinate the animal against. Probably because of the nature of this, uh, this, this, this dog owner, this breeder, this dog dealer, he hadn't bothered with the vaccinations. So, no vaccinated puppy, um, no, we, we declined the claim. This time, the owner's track record of never taking his dogs to the vet had backfired. And further investigations revealed he had another six policies in place ready to make claims on. Although, as far as Agria was concerned, this dog had had its day. 
But if people are determined to, uh, to, to defraud insurers, you know, sometimes they'll find a way. You know, luckily in this instance, uh, you know, we stopped three cases, stopped a potential six others. Um, you know, the downside of that was we paid two. In January 2012, the police joined the fight against insurance fraud by forming an elite squad known as IFED, the Insurance Fraud Enforcement Department. I would say to anyone who's considering committing insurance fraud that now this is no longer a crime without consequence that it may have been in the past. There is a dedicated 40 strong unit known as IFED that work 24 seven hunting down insurance fraudsters. They've made over 450 arrests and have saved millions of pounds in fraudulent insurance claims, money which ultimately goes back in our pockets. From now on, fraudsters need to watch their backs. So if you're thinking about it, I suggest think again. There's every chance you'll get an IFA detective come knocking on your front door. It's 5.30 a.m. and a team of IFED officers are on their way to give another suspected fraudster one of their unique wake-up calls. A man Taylor is heading up today's operation. Uh, this morning we're going to an address to effect an arrest, hopefully, of a uh, male who's, who we need to speak to regarding a insurance claim for the theft of his tools. They've subsequently paid him out £1,000 on the first occasion, and he's gone on to submit a further three claims, uh, and they've paid out £1,000 in total. It was the multiple claims on the suspect's contents insurance that led IFED to suspect foul play. What we were uh, looked to do this morning is to go in, uh, arrest our suspect, and then search for any items uh, relating to any offence, particularly fraud. Having arrived at the address, the team prepare to go in. the insurance fraud enforcement department in the city and the police and we need to speak to him all right the person who's answered the door is claiming the suspect is at work but ifed officers are a tenacious bunch and have persuaded the person at the door to call the suspect he's now on his way home and can look forward to a warm welcome from the ifed boys on his return and he's at work he's working night so we've just found him and he's coming back he'll be back in within the hour so that we can uh, hopefully speak to him there Sure enough, just under an hour later, the suspect arrives home. You're under arrest on suspicion of fraud by false representation, OK? You don't have to say anything at Malmo Defence. Do not meet you in question? Some of you later line in court and anything you do, some have given evidence, all right? But what we need to do is we need to search inside, all right? So we're looking for some items in particular. We'll, uh, we'll speak to you about exactly the items that we're looking for once we get inside. Got one. What? Go on. No, we're going to search his property under Section 32 of the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, right? That means someone, so we can search for any items that we believe are relevant. We can search for any evidence at all, actually, under Section 32, for the place that you immediately come from, which is your home address. With the legalities out of the way, the search gets underway, but the cameras remain outside. Almost an hour later, a man emerges from the property, having made an interesting discovery. Um, some receipts there, one for hundred pound, and just some paperwork and his mobile phone. The reason we seize his mobile phone is because uh, we believe that any photographs that have been taken of tools are more than likely going to have been taken on the mobile phone. So what we do is we take that back to the police station, we'll download it, download all the data from it, and then from that we can pick the bones out of it and see what information we want from the, from the data from the phone. But weeding out documents isn't the only success of the day, because the team have also unearthed something that the local police will be very keen to take a look at. One of the DCs has gone out to the shed out in the back, um, in the out, there's like a little outbuilding, they heard some whirring from inside, and then our suspect has said that he's growing 50 cannabis plants here. So uh, what we're doing now is I've called the local police force down to assist us with some uniform officers to dismantle it and seize it. What we'll do is we'll probably seize all of the plants and then from that take a, a specific sample, but it'll be a crime that'll be more likely investigated by police. For a man and IFED, it's an unusual bonus. 
After all, it isn't every day they arrest a suspected fraudster with green fingers. Uh, it's quite a sophisticated setup, so he's, uh, he's obviously taking quite a bit of time to put that together. Uh, the door's key coded to get in, which is totally unique, you know, something that I've not seen before in nine years of policing. As local police units arrive, the cannabis farm is dismantled and bagged up as evidence. As far as IFED is concerned, though, today was all about bringing a suspected insurance scammer to justice, and a man is happy with the way the raid has gone. I think we've got more than enough to look at going forward. Uh, obviously, won't know until we've interviewed him, so he's given an account of what he's got to say. As the last of the cannabis plants are removed, a man reflects on the morning's events. Yeah, it's been a good result, good result all round. Just stumbled across something that's, that's quite important. Although not important to our case, it still have, it will have a big impact on the local community. Every year, thousands of us Brits pack up and head off on our holidays. But unforeseen circumstances can mean that even the most perfectly planned trip away never gets off the ground. Thanks to travel insurance policies, we don't have to be out of pocket when disaster strikes. Although in 2013, the officers at the Insurance Fraud Enforcement Department discovered someone who saw these policies as a means of lining their pockets. Joanna Hunt is a case we dealt with last year. Uh, she was a mother um, of three children, and she booked a holiday to go to Lanzarote. Um, she booked this holiday two weeks before the flight, and within, within two days, she'd taken out seven policies of insurance to insure her risk against travel. A couple of days before she was due to set off, one of her children became unwell, and she took that child to see her GP. And the GP agreed that the child was unwell and would be unfit to travel. A child falling sick is one of those things that just can't be helped. But with seven insurance policies in place, Joanne Hunt was able to help herself. And that's precisely what she did. She made the claim on the policies. So the insurance company sent, sent her the claim forms and she made a claim on all seven policies. So the holiday cost 1,600 and had she have been paid out on all seven, she would have been making about £11,000. Almost £9,000 profit in the space of a few weeks wouldn't have been bad going. But fortunately, defrauding insurance companies isn't that easy. The fraud was uncovered when the insurance companies, they do talk to each other and they communicated that they were all about to pay out on a policy. So when they discovered that, they froze the payouts and they referred the case to ourselves. With IFED now running the investigation, Joanne Hunt was brought in for questioning. Joanne Hunt gave an explanation in interview which had to be checked out, so we went to see her GP. He confirmed that, yes, he had seen uh, the, young, the young daughter and she had been unwell. The seven claim forms were shown to the GP, and whilst he confirmed that he had signed one of the policies, he also said that the other six were forgeries of his own signature. In order to commit this fraud, Joanna Hunt had to forge several documents. The first one, of course, was the, the policy of insurance. She had to lie on that form um, to say she hadn't taken out other policies. She forged the signature of the doctor and also made a stamp from the surgery to authenticate the policy. There was never any dispute over the fact that Joanne Hunt's child was unfit to travel. But because she'd lied and forged documents to claim on multiple policies, IFED were now dealing with a clear-cut case of fraud. But, of course, Joanne Hunt had what she thought was a fair explanation of her actions. At the time, I don't think she realised how serious this case was, but when she was interviewed in the police station by IFED detectives, she tried to explain that the reason why she took out the seven policies wasn't in order to commit a fraud, she thought that she'd take out the seven policies so that when the paperwork arrived, she would then look at the small print and then decide which policy she wanted to continue to take out. The remaining six, she said she was intending to cancel, but she didn't. And she went on to claim on all seven policies. Unsurprisingly, IFED didn't buy Joanne's excuses, and so she was charged with seven counts of fraud by misrepresentation. 
Well, by the time she got to court, she realised that the court may not have accepted her excuses and having taken legal advice, she pleaded guilty in court. She was sentenced to a suspended prison sentence and she also received community service and a fine and costs. Like so many other scammers, Joanne Hunt had been seduced by greed and the prospect of making easy money. But she discovered the hard way that fraud is a crime which doesn't pay. Joanne Hunt was a young mother, 28 years old, mother of three children. So what set out to be a family holiday in Lanzarote, it turned into a nightmare for her and she's lost her, her good name for life. Having investigated cases like this for the past two years, Dom knows full well what the consequences of insurance fraud can be. I think generally the fraudsters who commit these crimes, they do think it is a faceless crime. But in fact, every person in the country who has a policy of insurance, whether it be for travel, whether it be household, whether it be health, we are all paying the extra on our policies because of these fraudsters. With two billion pounds a year lost through insurance fraud, companies are doing all they can to fight back. But one of the biggest problems they face is that lengthy investigations cost time, money and resources, which could be devoted to legitimate claims. The key to winning this battle is to try and identify fraudulent cases as quickly as possible. And one of the ways insurers are doing this is by using the likes of Sally Griffiths and her team of desktop investigators who are trained to spot dodgy claims over the phone. What we're really listening out for is what they say, but also how they say it. Signs of nervousness, hesitation, any indication at all that the customer is perhaps buying time or being evasive, using like certain techniques that we call um, parroting, repeating um, the, the question back so that we, we know that there's something not quite right, they can't answer the question fluidly. But the advantages of these techniques don't end there because Sally's team have also managed to identify which type of insurance fraudsters think is the easiest target. People believe that it's easier to commit travel insurance fraud uh, without getting caught. And also they believe that it's not gonna affect their, their no claims discount as it would do for a motor or a household claim. And believe it or not, travel insurance fraud can even be affected by the weather. During the summer months, we do have an increase in, in claims coming through as people are obviously going on holiday. The particular trend that we saw last year involved the nice weather that we had in England, and we found that there was an increase in cancellation claims. So it seemed that people were cancelling their overseas holidays in order to save money on that holiday and then stay at home and enjoy the sunshine here. So for anyone who thinks that conjuring up a bogus claim on their holiday insurance could be a nice little earner, Sally has some words of warning. People think that making a, a false traveller's insurance claim is going to be really easy. They can just come on the phone and speak to someone and it will be done and dusted. The reality is if they're speaking to a trained investigator, every lie that they say will be picked up on and they'll be caught out. <laughs> 